Welcome to Atmos 5000 Day 33. We are now in a new module, and we're going to be focusing in on Chapter 10, Section 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3 from the Stoll textbook. We're focusing in on constant pressure maps and plotting of winds. We'll review Newton's second law of motion, and we will provide an overview of the horizontal forces that are applied to air parcels in the atmosphere. And these uh, horizontal forces include the pressure gradient force, the centrifugal force, the Coriolis force, friction, and advection of momentum. So constant pressure maps are a way that we take a lot of data from Raywin Sons and synthesize it into a three-dimensional visualization of the atmosphere. So it takes the upper air data and puts the data onto standard pressure surfaces of uh, 92.5 kPa, 85, 70, 50, 30, 25, and 20 kilopascals. And on each of these uh, pressure maps, uh, we include information about the geopotential height, the temperature, the humidity, the wind speed, and the wind direction at that altitude, at that pressure surface. So here we have an example of a weather map uh, from a constant pressure surface. This one happens to be the 70 kilopascal pressure surface. If we look at Salt Lake City, then we can see that uh, the data for this particular one from the Raywin sond says that the geopotential height of this pressure surface is 316 decameters, which is 3,160 meters above sea level. The wind is from the southwest at 10 knots. The temperature is six degrees Celsius, and the dew point depression is 11. So the actual dew point would be six minus 11. So that would be um, minus five degrees Celsius. And so you can see that the data from those Raywinson launches is included here. And then superimposed upon that, we put on contours. Um, there are contours of geopotential height in black, and there are temperature contours in red, and then the relative humidity uh, in excess of 70%, 80%, 90% are shown in green. So essentially identifying those regions that have the highest humidity. So here we have the 70 kilopascal map, and next we'll look at a different elevation. So now we're looking at the, philo, the 50 kilopascal map, uh, it looks very similar to the 70, except we're at a higher altitude now. For Salt Lake City, the geopotential height of this pressure surface is 580 decameters, so 5,800 meters. The temperature is minus 14 degrees C. The dew point depression is 15, so that means that the actual dew point is minus 29 degrees Celsius, and the winds are from the west at 20 knots. Uh, we also superimposed on this uh, have uh, temperatures in temperature contours in the dashed blue line, the geopotential height contours in the solid black, and the humidity as shown before as well in the green. Now we have the 30 kilopascal pressure surface. Once we look at the Salt Lake City again, the height of this pressure surface is 946 decameters, so that is 9,460 meters. The temperature is minus 44 degrees Celsius, and it, it's hard to tell if it has a dew point depression. Maybe it's two. I'd have to look at it closer. The winds are from the southwest at 20 knots. Uh, and on this one, instead of having contours of temperature, and humidity. Instead, what are shown in the contours are essentially the isotacks, which are the wind speeds in knots. And so you can see that the jet stream, which is the wind of the, the strongest winds, are moving across uh, Canada and dipping down towards New York City on the right. And the wind speeds there uh, are approaching 100 knots uh, up in Canada, in eastern Canada. And I even see 120 knots or 125 knots being the fastest wind over in that area of the North American continent. So just a reminder on how we plot the winds. 
Uh, for the winds, we basically have arrows and feathers, and the, uh, the point of the arrow is situated on the uh, observation point, and the feathers are on the back, and the wind is pointing in the direction of the arrow. We have the feathers, which would basically be uh, calm winds, would be two concentric circles, uh, very uh, close to calm winds of one to two uh, speed units. And by speed units, we're talking either knots or meters per second or whatever the units happen to be on the map that you're dealing with. would have a shaft with no barbs of five speed units, would have a half shaft or a half bar, uh, not quite out at the end. Uh, 10 speed units would have a long bar at the end, and you can add those together until you get to 50, at which point you add in a flag, and you can add in as many flags as you need. And remember that the arrow is always pointing in the direction that the wind is moving. Recall that Newton's second law of motion is given by the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And... And according to this equation, the acceleration is proportional to the net force. And the acceleration is also inversely proportional to the mass of the object. And also, if the net force is zero on an object, um, then it's either not moving or is moving with a constant velocity. Uh, either way would satisfy Newton's uh, second law of motion. And this net force is important because in the atmosphere we have an air parcel that is subjected to multiple forces. And we have to add up the net force from all of these different horizontal forces in order to determine where that air parcel is going to move as a result of Newton's second law of motion. The first of those horizontal forces that we're going to talk about is the pressure gradient force. Uh, we're going to talk about the PGF, or the pressure gradient force, because it is the driver of winds in the atmosphere. It always points from high to low pressure, much like water always flows from high areas to low areas. Uh, the pressure gradient force points from high to low, and it's strongest when the pressure contours are closely packed, when we have a strong pressure gradient. Those strong pressure gradients will equal strong winds. So here we have a weather map. It has contours of sea level pressure on it. We have a low pressure zone uh, located just uh, on the shore of Virginia. And the contours indicate that the sea level pressure there is less than 968 millibars or 96.8 kilopascals. And as we move away from that location, the pressure is increasing. So we have pressure gradients that are pointing from high to low. So the low has obviously been indicated there and the pressure is higher all the way around this closed low. So everywhere around this low, the pressure gradient is going to point from the outside towards the center. And there are three examples uh, labeled PGF here of differing lengths of vectors. And the differing lengths on the vectors are driven by how closely packed the contours are, which is a representation of what the gradient of pressure actually is. So, for example, in Arkansas uh, to the west, uh, we have a relatively weak pressure gradient force, and the pressure gradient force arrow is short as a consequence. In the southeastern portion of this we have a pressure gradient out over the Atlantic Ocean that is a moderate pressure gradient. And it's pointed, once again, uh, orthogonal to the isopleths, so the lines of constant, or the isobars, um, the lines of constant pressure. And then in the interior of the United States, just north of the low pressure, we have a very strong pressure gradient because the isobars are closely packed, indicating a very strong pressure gradient. And once again, it's pointed directly from high to the low, uh, moving at a 90 degree angle across the isobars. So if we think about this horizontal pressure gradient, uh, it's akin to having more air on the left-hand side of this barrier than on the right. And the pressure difference over the distance of the sheet, in this case, um, the pressure gradient force will push this sheet uh, to the right. And the same thing happens in the atmosphere uh, 
but without a visual reference for moving things around. So the pressure gradient always points from high to low. And in this case, uh, we have a pressure gradient of essentially four millibars, uh, so 0.4 kilopascals. And if we had a distance between those two, then we could define the pressure gradient. And if the Earth was not rotating about its axis, the air would just move directly from areas of high to low pressure. And that would uh, cause the areas of low pressure to fill in and the high pressures would be reduced and before long would have relatively uniform pressure across the entire planet. But we are in fact on a rotating system and that rotation will have impacts on the ability of air to flow directly from high to low pressure. So one of the forces that we have to contend with is the centrifugal force. The centrifugal force is an outward directed force. Uh, it's an apparent force that's experienced by an object moving in a circular path. So we have two different types of centrifugal force. Well, one is due to the rotation of the Earth, which we'll deal with as part of the Coriolis force. And then we also have a, tr a true centrifugal force um, from a horizontal perspective where you have air that is flowing around low and high pressure zones and you will get a centrifugal force associated with that as well. We refer to this as an apparent force because it can't change the magnitude of the acceleration, uh, only its direction. And the direction of this force is always away from the axis of rotation. And the centrifugal force obviously depends on the mass of the object and the distance of the object from the center of rotation and the speed of the rotation itself. So there's a lot of factors that go into calculating the strength of the centrifugal force. So here we have a, a graphical representation of a person uh, basically uh, spinning a ball on a string that's attached to them. Uh, there is a center of rotation. Uh, there is the tangential velocity in green. Uh, in this case, we have a centripetal force, which is the inward directed force on the ball, which is exhibited by the string. And then we have the outward directed centrifugal force, which is the apparent force uh, that is uh, counteracting the centripetal force. And the centrifugal force essentially is equal to the mass times the tangential velocity squared divided by the radial arm or the uh, distance from the center of rotation. If you wanted to do this in terms of the uh, angular velocity omega, uh, then F is going to be equal to M times omega squared R. So in addition to the outward directed centrifugal force due to rotation around high and low pressure zones, air parcels are also subjected to a, an apparent force known as the Coriolis force, which is due to the rotation of the planet. Uh, and the centrifugal force associated with that rotation. Uh, this, the Coriolis force is only present because the reference frame, uh, in this case the Earth, is rotating. And we have a short little video that will help hopefully uh, improve your understanding of the Coriolis force next. Hopefully you enjoyed that uh, little video about the Coriolis effect. And just remember that it's due to the rotation of the planet. And uh, if the motion does not last very long relative to the time that the Earth is rotating, then you could in fact ignore the Coriolis effect. But if the motion exists for a few hours, then the planet will be able to rotate significantly during that time period, and you will have to take the Coriolis uh, effect uh, into consideration. And the way we can kind of think of this is you can think of this as if you are standing on the North Pole and moving down towards the equator, um, and, and you're basically moving in a straight line, the Earth will rotate underneath. Uh, which will cause an apparent deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere and a deflection to the left in the northern hemisphere. There's another way to think about it as well, which has to do with the conservation of angular momentum. So as you move north, uh, 
you actually decrease the distance between the uh, air parcel and the axis of rotation. So much like a uh, ice skater that uh, starts off rotating with their arms spread wide, when they bring those arms in, uh, they are uh, changing the radial arm and will cause a apparent spin up in order to uh, conserve the angular momentum that they had. And the same thing is happening here uh, in uh, the Earth in this uh, diagram. So when you actually move to the north, um, the, you're changing the radial arm and you have to spin up, which means that you have to spin faster. And likewise, when you move south, you have to, uh, uh, basically you're increasing the radial arm and your rotation will slow down relative to the underlying planet. This also works for the explanation for the east-west motion as well. So if you happen to be moving from west to east, then you're spinning up, you're increasing your angular uh, rotation, your angular momentum. And one way to compensate for that is to move to a lower latitude where the radial arm is lower. Uh, or consequently, if you are moving from east to west, um, you are moving slower than the uh, planet. And to conserve your angular momentum, if you move to a higher latitude, um, you can conserve your angular momentum. And so all of those are different ways of looking at the same issue. And they all arise because we're on a curved planet that happens to be rotating. So just to summarize the Coriolis force, <clears throat> it acts to the right of the motion in the northern hemisphere and to the left of the motion in the southern hemisphere. And it's zero at the equator. It's an apparent force. Uh, it can't speed up or slow down an air parcel, but it can, it can cause it to move, uh, change directions. The Coriolis force is strongest near the poles and zero at the equator. And it really only affects motions which last longer than a few hours because that's how long it takes for the Earth's rotation to move in a significant way. And the other thing about the Coriolis force is that it's proportional to the wind speed. The stronger the winds, the stronger the Coriolis force. Friction. Uh, friction opposes the motion, so it always acts to slow down the air parcel. It acts in the opposite direction of the motion, and it happens to be greatest near the Earth's surface. And that makes sense because we have a lot of roughness elements, trees, buildings, uh, vegetation, that can create uh, roughness and increase the friction associated with that. So rough surfaces and mountainous terrain have the greatest amount of friction. And the net impact of friction is that it causes the air to cross the isobars from high to low pressure. And lastly, we have horizontal advection of momentum. So we've dealt with horizontal advection of temperature and pressure before, uh, and now we're just dealing with the uh, advection of momentum. So the horizontal advective force, uh, if you multiply everything by m, would equal minus u times m times delta u over delta x. So we have uh, u, which is our horizontal velocity in the east-west direction, times mass, times the gradient of the east-west wind in the east-west direction. And likewise, minus V is the uh, north-south wind uh, affecting the uh, gradient of the east-west wind in the north-south plane, delta Y, or the last term being the vertical advection, where we have W, which is the vertical wind, um, times the a change in the east-west wind U over height sort of thing. And all of these can contribute to uh, a force on an air parcel as well. And we have it here for the F of X in the east-west uh, plane and F of Y in the north-south plane.